Hello, everyone. It's good to see everyone again. Uh, I wanted to talk about a, a brief history of food. So if we're going to understand about macrobiotics and diets in general, it's, it's good to have an understanding about the, the, the history. And this was also inspired because throughout the years, I've heard macrobiotics referred to as a, as a fad diet, which I find fascinating because macrobiotics is a traditionally based way of eating and living based on all the world's longest standing civilizations. And through my studies, I've realized they all had a similar pattern of, of diet and lifestyle, which, which is fascinating. That's consistent with yin and yang and even the five transformations. So uh, at any rate, so modern agriculture began, was or rediscovered around 10 or 1,000 years, 10, 12,000 years ago when the last ice age receded over Europe. So we're in an interglacial warming period right now. There have been four major ice ages in the last million years. The last one, the ice sheet receded uh, from Europe about 10 or 12,000 years ago, which led to the rediscovery of agriculture and grain cultivation. Now, wild grasses have been around for a long, long time, but modern cultivated grains didn't just spring up. They were hybridized. They were created from, from different groups of people. So 10, 12,000 years ago, agriculture and grain cultivation uh, developed. There were great strides. And one other thing happened around the same period of time, which was there were great strides in boat building, which was really essential for the development of civilizations because because due to agriculture, people could stay in the same place. They didn't have to be hunters, hunter gatherers. Because of boat building, they could communicate and exchange. So those two things led to the development of civilization. So things developed gradually, and we have the major grains that were eaten and were developed and in different parts of the world rice in Asia, uh, barley and millet also in, in Asia, um, wheat, bar barley, no, barley and wheat in the Middle East. And all people over time became synonymous with their grain. It's the most important thing. It's, it's actually our identity, who we are. So you can't separate rice from Asia. You can't separate corn from the Americas or bread free from Europe or anything like that. It's the beginning. It's, it's really who we are. It's our, den, or it's our identity. It's even our ancestral memory. Then the next major change was between four and 6,000 years ago, the megalith builders. So between four and 6,000 years ago, megaliths, huge standing structures were built on every continent. They were, they were here in the Americas. I mean, we know about the pyramids in, in Egypt and um, Ireland and Wales are especially famous for all their spectacular megaliths. But every, every continent has uh, different megalithic sites. And together with those megalithic sites, then the dispersal of grains also took place. So whoever it was, whatever groups of people, they traveled, they dispersed grains. They also built these huge uh, ancient structures, which now, since modern, as modern people, we think everyone who came before us was more primitive and really didn't know much. But uh, according to my understanding and discoveries, these megaliths were part of ancient technology that really made the land fertile and was also part of their energy technology. So it was a crucial part of their society. Now, there's a bit of legend that I learned from Michio. It's called the sun, moon, and stars. So there's a little bit out there, but I, I, I'd like to uh, introduce it be, because I always find it fascinating. So when George Osawa introduced macrobiotics, he talked about indigenous foods, eating foods that originated in the same or similar climatic region. 
And the most important point with that is the latitude in which we live. What degree of angle we receive the sun's energy and light. At any rate, the distribution of foods for the last 6,000 years is not north to south as it should be. In other words, when we travel north or south, there are great variations in climate and weather and sun and all these things. But when we travel east and west, there's not. But for the last 6,000 years, four to 6,000 years, the division was east and west. Why would that be? It's, it's a fascinating question. It doesn't, well, it does make sense or it doesn't make sense at, at any rate. So according to the sun, moon and stars in the east, they would take the sun as their symbol, as their flag, and they would eat whole grains. And because they ate whole grains, which provide the most nourishment, because a whole grain is the seed and fruit merged into one without any separation, grains can store for at least hundreds or maybe even thousands of years and still sprout and then still reproduce. So as long as the bran of the grain is undisturbed, they keep their life's force and their nourishment. So whole grains supply the most complete, well-balanced nourishment. Because of that, they needed very few supplemental foods. In other words, their diet could be more simple. When I lived in Japan, there was almost nothing. The only grain basically was rice. <clears throat> you saw sweet rice, you know, around New Year's, uh, udon and soba, so wheat and barley through noodles, beans were made in the azuki beans, and you saw black soybeans um, around the New Year. There were vegetables. In other words, the diet was very, very simple. I mean, unbelievably simple. They didn't have so in the East, they had whole grains. They didn't have much need of supplements, special animal, especially animal and dairy foods and other foods as well. And spirituality. They didn't really develop religion in, in the Far East. They developed spirituality like Taoism, Shinto, things of that, which are really more way of life like macrobiotic. In the Middle East, though, then they said, we'll take the moon as our flag and symbol and we'll have cracked grains. And because we're eating more crack grains and then some flatbreads, then we'll need more supplemental foods and then animal food started to increase more and some baking and then philosophy and religion developed. Then in the West, they said, we'll take stars as our flag, as our image, like our own flag, we have stars and we'll eat bread as our main food and bread, so crack grain has less nutrition than whole grain, but still similar. Bread is a very different you know, food. So then we'll need more supplemental foods and the diet became very wide and varied and we'll develop science, technology and analytical thinking. Now, whether that's a mythology, this reality, I mean, this is basically what we've had. Now, what's interesting in recent years since you know, um, especially in the 20th century, then East and West started to combine more. Each started to attract each other. So the big question is why would they make an East-West distribution? These people who could build giant stone structures that were you know, accurate astronomically today, thousands of years later, and also had many other uses so people with that type of technology and understanding, why would they do that? In other words, it, it couldn't be by accident. My thinking is it's so that we could come to this point in history where we can make a choice of how we're gonna move forward to the future. So again, according to Osawa's understanding and teachings, the distribution of food should be East and West. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that. So, at any rate, so then civilizations before 6,000 years ago, everything was organic. It was simply processed. It was unrefined. We can, and it was local and indigenous. So up until that time, people really were practicing macrobiotics. Now, 
from the time of ancient Greece and Rome, so let's say some 2,500 years ago, because trading and conquering, they started to confuse the world's food supply. They started to bring tropical and subtropical foods, plants, and cooking styles to temperate climatic regions through the spice trade. So sugar, spices, and tropical fruits, all these exotic things were brought to temperate regions. That means from the last 2,500 years, food on this planet has not been completely natural. Yes, it's been, for the most part, it's been unrefined. For the most part, it's been natural, but it hasn't been indigenous. It hasn't been balanced climatically. So that set the stage for the development of different diseases because it created different nutritional imbalances. Once we start to eat foods from a different climatic region, then we start to connect to the planet in a different way. Then that's the beginning of imbalance. But the diet was still relatively natural until the next major change was the industrial revolution. And this was the biggest change because, because of technology, because of the steam engine, the locomotive cities were able to be formed. And factories were, be, were able to be formed. And then we had the technology to start food refining. So the industrial revolution was the beginning of large scale imbalance because we started to refine foods. Before that, there was refining. Grains could be sifted. It was, it was either in a community or a family basis, there was some refining taking place, but it was very little, it was minor. Once we had the technology, we could refine grains. First, the stone mill to naturally grind, and then a roller mill, steel mills, that uh, really started to destroy the quality and the nutritional value of the grain. So that was one major change. The second change was people formed cities, and then they started to work in factories. So before that, we were largely an agrarian society small farms. People had their, grew their vegetables, maybe they grew grains or beans, they had their cows, pigs, and chickens. Those animals, the manure went back to the soil. It was very rich in B12. People had nourishment from that as long as they, as long as they had food. Right? So, but then because of factories, then eating habits, became disrupted for the first time. Because before that, lunch, the noon meal was the main meal. And that continued because when you see old movies and shows, you see the factory whistle blows, everything stops. You know, people eat their lunch together. So that was the beginning of, um, you know, major changes together with that because of advances in science and discovery of protein, then proteins began to be um, emphasized. Things started to become much more confused. Now, the one thing that I really wanted to touch on, I hear from people all the time, I say, in the past, people didn't eat so much animal food as we do now. And then people would say back to me, well, we always ate animal food. We ate meat three meals a day, every day. That's, you know, that was a part of our diet. And a lot of people, as you know, are identify as meat and potatoes. So I really tried to find some accurate information on that. And I discovered this document that had really detailed information from historical records. And what it turns out is before the Industrial Revolution, the average meat consumption in Europe was five to 10 kilograms per person per year. That means 
11 to 22 pounds per person per year. Most of it was for holidays and festivals in the, forms of, in the form of roasts or stews. So a village would roast an animal or they'd make a huge stew and everybody would be feasting on this around the, the festival time. So if you take that into account, five to 10 kilograms, that means the most animal food people could have been eating is two to four ounces per week, not per day, not per meal, but two to four ounces per week. And as you probably know, in the past, a lot of meat consumption was meat cooked in things, beef, barley, stew, you know, pork and beans, beef, vegetable stew. So the, a lot of the animal food was part of our food. So up until the industrial revolution, people were still eating, you know, a macrobiotic style diet for the, for the most part. Then there were three exceptions that were listed in this document, Japan, China, and India. They had an average of two kilograms per person per year. That means four and a half pounds per year. Again, most at holidays, festivals, on holidays, feasts. And Japan is the only country that had no history of dairy food consumption. Okay. So it's interesting that George Osawa fashioned macrobiotics. Fashion macrobiotics. Well, number one is Japanese, but at the same time, he chose traditional uh, temple cooking from Buddhist monks who had great longevity, great vitality. So, and it's very interesting that the founders were also, of our country were also agriculture, agriculturalists. And they were all interested in agriculture. They were all interested in land and they were all interested in saving and dispersing seeds, exchanging seeds. And the diversity of foods, if you would see a chart, of, let's say like a carrot, how many carrots there were then compared to now? Now, so up until recently, there was an orange carrot, that's it. Then we started to see orange, red, yellow, purple. We see diversity, black, all different colors of carrots. Like, so people are trying to go back to what we had. A cucumber, endless numbers of variety. To pick any vegetable, there were endless numbers of variety. I've seen charts, how many of there were and how they diminished over the years. So, you know, especially since Monsanto, everything they've, uh, you know, they've reduced much more. But, the point I'm trying to make is that the founders had very similar ideals to uh, macrobiotics of being close to land, of having natural food, of eating real food. And yes, they had animal and, and dairy foods, but this was again before the Industrial Revolution, right? So their diet was still simply based. So that means then what is the macrobiotic diet? As I mentioned earlier, the macrobiotic diet is traditionally based. It's not based on one tradition. Now, although, because it was introduced by George Osao and then further by Michio Kushi and Herman Ihara and other Japanese people, it, I, I call it Japan-centric. But what the macrobiotic diet is, is taking the most unique foods from the world's traditional foods that are acceptable in a climatic region. So we use all of the major grains, we use brown rice, barley, millet, wheat, corn, oats, rye, and buckwheat, which is botanically not a wild grain, but has been used as a wild grain for many thousands of years. So we use all the major grains. In beans, the three principal beans in macrobiotics are azuki beans, which is the main bean of Asia, 
lentils, which are the main bean of Europe, and then chickpeas, which are the main bean of the Middle East. These are the three most important beans on the planet. Then in vegetables, we eat all vegetables that are suitable to a temperate climatic region. Seeds and nuts, then we have tahini from the Middle East. We have peanut butter from the West, right? So, so forth like that. We have um, sourdough bread, unused sourdough bread from Europe. We have grains, we have chapati, we have polenta. So we have all the unique foods from around the world, which means macrobiotics and then in fermentation. So we have miso, but then we also have sauerkraut and kimchi. We have umeboshi plums and olives. We have brown rice vinegar and uh, apple cider vinegar. So you, you, you get, you get the, the picture. Um, we're using all the unique feeds, foods from around the world. Now, if we make the change which needs to be made, changing from an east-west division of food and change it to a north-south as it should be, then we have the same understanding according to our climatic region. Because in the Far East, instead of just eating whole grains, we'll be eating whole grains, cracked grains, and bread. In the West, instead of eating bread, we're eating whole grains, cracked grains, and bread. In the Middle East, it's the same. And then North and South, we adjust the climate. So basically, we're in the infancy, infancy of creating the macrobiotic way of eating. We're recreating because many of these things were lost. So what we're doing now is constantly trying to readjust things. But when you look at it, what people have done for thousands of years, <clears throat> the diet was the same everywhere. Whether you're talking about Asia, um, India, the Middle East, all of Europe, um, the Americas and Africa, the same pattern, grains, beans, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and fruits, mild sweets, mild beverages, and naturally fermented foods. It's the same pattern everywhere, right? Grains, beans, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and fruits, mild beverages, tea, coffee, herbal teas, as, you know, compared to um, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, um, the high caffeinated, you know, drinks, etc. So, and sweeteners, rice syrup, uh, barley malt, honey, um, maple syrup, mild sweeteners compared to the sweeteners we have now. So really exactly the same pattern. Now, Japan has the greatest health and longevity, although they're losing it, but still is today, the greatest health and longevity of any country. So they had the same pattern. However, they had two foods they added, soy products and seaweeds. Now seaweeds were eaten in other countries. They were eaten throughout Asia. They were eaten uh, by all island and coastal people everywhere on the planet. The only exception is Africa and they ate river and lake weeds. So everywhere ate seaweed. In Southeast Asia, they ate seaweed together with river weeds and lake weeds. Africa, only river weeds and lake weeds, right? So again, Japan made a special use of seaweed, even more than China, and soy products. And I think that was a difference. And because of that, and going back historically, they had no history of dairy food consumption. According to Colin Campbell's research, casein, dairy protein, is the most carcinogenic food on the planet, right? Even more than, than meat. So I, I find that very interesting that 
when we have soy products, miso and shoyu, et cetera, then people say, well, that's Asian food. But no, it's not. It's ancient uh, advanced technology to create superfoods, so to speak, that aid in health and longevity that are more important than ever now because they both have the same ability. They can neutralize and eliminate from the body radiation and heavy metals. Right? And not only that, probably EMFs as well, electromagnetic fields and radio waves. So the foods that are really more important than ever to include as part of our diet. Then science has finally discovered what oriental medicine has known for thousands of years that we have two brains, one is here, the other is in our gut, and the one in our gut controls this one. So in order to have a healthy gut, we need prebiotics, which means fiber, grains, beans, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and fruits. Then we need probiotics, natural fermentation. Now each region has different fermentation, but again, if we look to uh, Japan or Asia, it's unique because miso really is a pickle. The way I see it, fermentation is without salt, pickles are with salt. Miso is a pickle. That means it's fermented grains and beans. It's unique. Sauerkraut, which actually came from China, not from Germany, but um, at any rate, and kimchi from Korea is a pickled vegetable. Sauerkraut, kimchi, and pickled cucumbers are the most unique pickles on the planet. Then umeboshi is a pickled fruit. Olives are pickled fruit, but umeboshi has more uniqueness than the olive, although well, the olive is wonderful as well. So what I'm trying to say is the fermented foods we use are in each category of food that we eat that's unique. Fermented grains and beans and miso. Fermented vegetables in sauerkraut, kimchi, homemade pickles. Fermented fruits in umeboshi and olives, then vinegars, then other foods. So it's the most unique supply of foods. That means that macrobiotics not only is not a fad diet, it's the most traditional way of eating on the planet that has passed the test of time many times over because all the world's great civilizations developed themselves on this way of eating and a similar way of living to what we call macrobiotics now. Now, what I find interesting is everyone knows vegetarian, everyone knows vegan, but so few people know macrobiotics. It's a mystery because not only does macrobiotics have the most unique way of eating, we have the philosophy, the unifying principle in yin and yang, which enable us to develop it as a healing art and to adapt it endlessly for times. So what I call SHI macrobiotics, the second wave of macrobiotic practice after Osawa and Kushi, where we are incorporating the world's cuisine and incorporating the world's lifestyle practices all into one to make something that's really unique to move us to the future. So this is the first part of a brief history of foods. And next time I'll start at the industrial revolution and the changes that, that made from that. But so um, I'm glad you're part of the most unique way of eating and living on the planet. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. All right, thank you, Denny, once again, as always, for that very insightful discussion. Um, the time is now 4.53 Eastern time, so I'd say we probably definitely have at least like 10, 15 minutes or so for some Q&A. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be taking questions directly in the chat here for Zoom, and I will also be looking at the chat over in Facebook as well. So if you're curious of how to, you know, submit some questions, you can either send them directly to the chat here. I'll send a quick message that says hello. You can send a chat back, say hello back to me with a of a question. You can also, I'm going to allow individuals to unmute themselves. Um, and then when you unmute, I just ask that you wait to be called upon and then I can directly um, call upon you for your question. So there is one question that already was submitted and it asked, I guess, what are river weeds, Denny? You mentioned river weeds. What are they? 
Well, they're like, they're like seaweeds, so plants that grow in, in rivers and lakes. And they do have a certain degree of, of you know, minerals and they act as filters like, like seaweed. But for hotter climates, they're, they're more suitable. All righty, thank you. Let's see. So just taking a look here in the chat. Let's see. Going back to Facebook here. All righty. What warm drink do you recommend for the morning? Teas are too bitter and drying. Denny. Well, um, if you make them mild or less bitter or drying, I mean, a lot of people like black coffee, which is fine. You can just have warm water if you want. Um, so something warm is, is ideal in, in the morning. Um, I mean, herbal teas, I guess, if you think bancha, which, which is a bit drying. Roasted barley tea is far less dry. Um, herbal teas. So I guess it depends on your preference or just, just plain water. But um, a lot of macrobiotic people like coffee, black filtered coffee. I, I happen to be one of them. And uh, so that, that's okay as well. All right, thank you. Looking here over in Facebook, so Margo, the, this discussion will not be transcribed, so to speak, but the recording will stay on Facebook where you're viewing it now. And it will also be available on SHI's website under free resources and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channels, both SHI and Denny's YouTube channel. So um, definitely able for individuals to rewatch. Um, I do believe though, YouTube does have a closed caption feature that sometimes populates in case there's an individual who's unable to hear this, if that's what you're also asking about too. So uh, multiple opportunities for an individual to be able to rewatch or learn this information. Let's see, our next question, is watercress considered a river weed? Uh, no, <laughs> it's, a, it's a vegetable, it's a unique vegetable. All uh, leafy greens we classify as yin, with one exception, watercress, it, it's very young. Watercress is really one of the most unique vegetables. And the only place I know to get good watercress is an Asian market, because unfortunately, most of the watercress we see um, in health food stores is hydroponic, which is not the same. Watercress grows in the, by the edge of a stream. And um, interestingly enough, our water, um, our local uh, farmer's market this year in the spring had wild watercress for several weeks, which, which is really wonderful. But if you're able to find real watercress in an Asian market, even though it's not organically grown, I, I would suggest eating it. It's probably the most unique leafy green vegetable there is. You can steam it, you can saute it, cook it in soups or salads, however you like. All righty, thank you. Let's see. All right, our next question. Are there ways of cooking that are common across the traditional cultures? Well, cooking is according to climate. And we just completed a seminar, The Power of Foods, our first on-site in a long time where I talked about these things in, in detail. But um, basically, in colder climates, cooking is to preserve heat and warmth, to preserve energy. In hotter climates, cooking is to disperse heat and energy, but preserve, disperse heat, but preserve energy. So the idea we cook more in cold climates and not in hot climates is not true because like, for example, many people think beans are a uh, cold climate food, but hot climates, hot regions eat far more beans, Mexico, India, for example. Um, and a hot place like India has a lot of long 
uh, cooked vegetable dishes long boiled. So boiling, sauteing, steaming, uh, those are pretty common. As far as baking, baking is more colder climates. It's more suitable in colder climates, whether it's bread or vegetables or oats or beans. So in the colder climates, to again, to preserve heat where it gets really cold and dark, then baking becomes more, more important. But other than that, it's, it's you know, country by country or region by region. All righty, thank you. Um, Nancy, I saw that you had yourself unmuted. Oh, I see your hand is now raised. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself, Nancy. Sorry, and I lost my connection. I had to restart, so forgive me if you just were answering this or, or sure. if I, um, I'm duplicating. Um, so, on the I understand going east west, um, but how far like north and south can you go? I mean, obviously you don't have to stay within you know two miles of where you are, but how like I'm I'm in Austin, Texas, so how far could I go into, for example, more like uh, and we're on the same latitude as northern India, which is a milder cooking style than southern India. How far north and south can we go without running into trouble? Okay, so a general rule of thumb for people who are in, um, familiar with and understand yin and yang, the more yang the food, the more latitude you have in areas where it's suitable. The more yin should be closer to home. So grains can be, you know, east, west, around the world in the same climatic region. <clears throat> so basically, the temperate climatic region is um, 26 degrees to about 50 degrees, maybe 55. So subtropics begin at 26 degrees, tropics at 23 and a half degrees, about. And the colder latitudes above, above 50 degrees. So grains and beans are good within the whole temperate latitude. Vegetables, within, you know, ideally a couple hundred miles, but then again, you can go east and west because, you know, we eat California vegetables here on the East Coast. Um, fruits should be as local and as seasonal as possible. And the most local should be water. Water is the most delicate and the most crucial to be close to home. So now people are eating these imported bottled waters I think home filtration, a carbon-based home filtration system is the best for water and is really uh, making it the freshest water. So that's, uh, that's the general rule of thumb. Seaweed and salt in the same hemisphere. So seaweed, salt and fermentation is better not to uh, cross hemispheres because the magnetic charge um, changes. So I was enjoying wine, and I know Chile has some wonderful wines, but <laughs> I always try to stick to the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> All righty, thank you. So I would say maybe we would have time for one or two more questions. If anyone wants to ask, as a reminder, you can either just type it in the chat, unmute yourself and I'll call upon you. Um, if you're on Facebook, I'll just try to quickly move back and forth. Um, so if anyone has another question, um, otherwise we can wrap up with some updates. Yeah. Nancy, did you have another question? Yeah, I'll go if nobody else has. has sure, any. yeah. I'm just curious about what the home filtration system is that you use, is there one that you recommend? Well, for years we used Berkey and we still use it like, you know, for camping and other. So uh, I think Berkey is, is the best that we found. For a home uh, filtration system, uh, we use ProPure, which has a similar technology. So basically you have carbon-based or you have reverse osmosis, and then they sometimes remineralize it for drinking water. But to me, it's like, refining grain and then putting the uh, yeah. you know, the bread in the churn back. It, you can't break it apart and put it back together as a whole. So for that reason, I think that, you know, carbon charcoal, carbon-based 
filtration system is best. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty, so I don't see any other questions or any other individuals indicating that they have a question. So I think uh, we can wrap up at this moment. Um, I can go into some updates, but Denny, if you have any closing words, feel free. Um, that somehow we have to figure out how to really um, let people know the uniquenesses of this way of eating and how it can enhance the vegetarian and, and vegan diets or um, people who still, you know, choose to eat animal and dairy foods, how adding this way in understanding, um, because not only is this way of eating build self-reliance, but it also, uh, builds natural healing ability and natural immunity, which are probably gonna be the single most important thing going forward into the future, having strong health and strong natural immunity that can protect us pretty much against anything. I mean, basically um, germs are our friends. <laughs> There's no life without germs on, on every level. And to make them enemies is just, it's not the right, of, right way of seeing things, right? So for me, I always think, you know, germs are my friends. And if you have friendly germs, you don't have unfriendly germs that can populate you. It's just, it, it's, it's a choice. So it's a choice macrobiotics where we're connecting with all levels of life. And that's really, so it's not just health, it's, just, it's not just nutrition. The macrobiotic way of eating and living is connecting us with every level of life from the most simple and basic and primitive to the most complex. And giving us the ability to communicate and understand really on, on all levels at the same time. So now it's, you know, I've said a number of times before, it's really the beginning of the age of macrobiotics. And I really think now is the time where opportunities will open up. So spread the word far and wide. <laughs> I'm sure it's All right. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Denny. And as I mentioned, that'll be the end of our Q&A, but just some updates. So you're aware of what's going on with SHI. As I mentioned, this was part one. We will have a part two in just about one, two, three weeks, if you want to mark your calendars, but I will be sending out the link for that tomorrow with the updates on the 1st of December, which is going to be part two of a brief food, uh, brief history of foods. So um, we'll be joining again on Wednesday at uh, 4 p.m. at that time. If you're looking for some more information for macrobiotics this week and just can't get enough, we do have a webinar this Saturday, which is going to be about holiday reset. So as people are, you know, having great, good quality foods, enjoying their time with family and friends, um, you know, how to reset in case maybe if you overdo it or how to stay balanced or whatever it may be. I'm going to send a link here. So in case you're interested in that topic or more information, you can just go directly to that. But as I mentioned, I'll make sure to include that information in the follow-up email that I send tomorrow. Um, Denny already alluded to it. We will be having a fall macrobiotic conference for those who have not had the opportunity to register. Not this weekend, but next weekend on the 20th and 21st, we have an amazing lineup. Of course, Denny and Susan are going to be presenting, as well as you know, Larry and Nori Okushi. Um, Jessica Porter will be there as well, too. We're going to have Martin Halsey, Laura Castaldi. We're going to have Patrick Riley, as well as Alice Fava. Um, and we're going to have, as I mentioned, an amazing lineup from, you know, morning to evening for Saturday and Sunday. For those of you who counsel with Denny, especially if you've seen him in the last you know, two months or so, you would have received a special code just to get you know, an incentive for that. So definitely check if you have not checked your emails recently, if you've had a consultation with him. We um, already passed our early bird pricing, but we do have discounts if you are a senior, um, if you're a military teacher, medical professional, all those different things. Or let's just say you have a, a, a person that you know that you're a family member or friend that's a student we have a special discount for students of $45. So that's absolutely a steal for the whole weekend. So definitely let individuals know about that because if they do want that discount, they will have to contact SHI directly. Um, regarding this particular session for today, that recording is already on Facebook for those who follow Denny on his specific 
page there. It will be uploaded to YouTube channels tomorrow and I'll be sending out a special recording for that as well too in an email along with all these other updates that I just mentioned as well too. So um, that's all that I have for now. Denny, did you have something you wanted to add? I think this the fall conference is really a special one because so many people are exposed to the idea that uh, oil is not a healthy food. Yet oil has at least a 6,000 year history, at least olive and sesame oil and the greatest civilizations on our planet. So I've asked Larry Cushy um, to speak about, and salt is also vilified as well, to speak about salt uh, and oil from a scientific epidemiological perspective. Because I think it's very important to, you know, hear both sides so we, so we can make valid choices. Without George Osawa, there'd be no macrobiotics. George Osawa is the founder of modern day macrobiotics. And Norio Kushi um, also has a very unique uh, perception and understanding and view of, of the real meaning of Osawa's teachings, which I think, um, you know, that you, anyone who's seriously interested in macrobiotics will, will find very insightful. And of course, Jessica Porter, uh, the hip chick is, always um, very interesting and thought provoking. So together with a lot of other teachers. Um, so hope to see you there. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Thank you to Ron for making it happen. Good to see everyone. All righty, thank you. Have a good night everyone who's on Zoom here and who's on Facebook. We'll see you soon at the next webinar and presentation. Have a good night. Bye-bye.